Tina Kutu, welcome everyone to another of our with buyer control session of the buyer security bonanza. Today we welcome Ronnie, who is a senior researcher specializing in weed buyer control. Among the wide variety of projects she is leading, Ronnie will present one of the latest agents that she imported and tested in our containment facility in the hope to better control Chilean flame creeper. Just a quick note for the audience, anyone can put their questions in the chat. We will manage the questions at the end of the presentation. If we run out of time, any unanswered questions will be handed offline so everyone can get a response. This session is now being recorded and all recordings will hopefully be available on our website within the next week. If anyone would like to connect with Ronnie on product ideas or future opportunities, you are more than welcome. And you can make contact to Ronnie via our website and search for her name. And now I will hand over to Ronnie. Thank you, Arno. Tēnā koutou kia tau mai, tēnei ahi ahi. Welcome, everyone. Before I start talking about Chilean Flame Creeper, I would just like to acknowledge my co-authors on this talk, um, Robin, Simon and Hernan, our collaborator from Chile. And I would also like to acknowledge the funding for this project, which is coming from the Ministry for Primary Industry through the Sustainable Food and Fibre Futures Fund and the National Biocontrol Collective. I am taking a guess that Perhaps some of you are not that familiar with the weed, Chilean flame creeper, so I'd like to acquaint you with it. Chilean flame creeper, or Tropiolum speciosum, is a climber that is native to Chile. In the top photo on this slide, you can see, if you can find it, you can see what it looks like in the native range. Um, pretty difficult to spot, it is a rare plant in its native range. In New Zealand, it is mainly a problem in Southland and Otago, getting to be quite a big problem in Canterbury and starting to be an emerging problem in the Manawatu region. And in the bottom picture in this, uh, on this slide, you can see what it looks like in New Zealand. So as a climber, it smothers remnants of bush, native bush, um, covers, uh, uh, prevents light penetration. And some of you may be familiar specifically with this photo because uh, it did make it to the cover of the report uh, that came out in late 2021 by the Parliamentary, Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, that report about uh, environmental weed in New Zealand. So pretty top-notch weed. The beetle, the, the beetle sorry, that we're um, looking at exploring as a biocontrol agent um, was a serendipitous discovery from 2019. Uh, it is called Blaptea elguetai, it's a leaf beetle, a chrysomelid, and it was discovered when our team member Chantal, uh, who is in the picture there, went uh, over to Chile together with Environment Southlands, uh, Randall, who is uh, also in that picture, to look for uh, a rust pathogen for another Southland weed, uh, the Darwin's Barbary, which you can hear about in Chantal's talk tomorrow. Uh, as they were looking for uh, this agent, together with our collaborator in the middle of, uh, between them in that photo, Hernan, uh, they were keeping an eye opportunistically uh, on Chilean flame creeper, just to see if they can find anything that looks promising. And long and behold, they saw this, uh, these larvae of a leaf beetle munching on Chilean flame creeper doing quite severe damage to this plant and not munching on anything else. So that looked like something worth pursuing. And uh, we started doing a little bit more investigation about that. So this discovery, this serendipitous discovery was in late 2019. And I remind you that something else happened in late 2019, which caused quite a bit of a delay and a hassle in quite a lot of our programs. And that was COVID-19. So we could not travel, we couldn't bring the agent to containment in New Zealand for uh, a few more years. Uh, but Hernan was able to do a little bit more work on it and learn a little bit more about its biology um, in between travel restrictions within Chile. And nothing was really known about the biology of, the, of this beetle. All that was published about it was a couple of papers about the taxonomy. 
So really it was starting from scratch and Hernan in his home arrangement away from any facilities was able to do some preliminary studies. And so what Hernan discovered in these studies was uh, the very basics of the biology, starting with the eggs. That actually took quite a long time to discover where those beetles were laying their eggs because it wasn't on the plant. Eventually, Hernan found those eggs uh, laid in the leaf litter underneath the plant, or sometimes, as you can see in that top picture. And in the bottom picture, uh, there's another scenario. We can see uh, there is an egg here. And you can see that it is laid on a plant that it grows in association with Chilean flame creeper. This is a native Chilean bamboo, and the Chilean flame creeper climbs around that bamboo. The egg is laid on the bamboo. Larvae uh, seem to uh, go through about five larval stages across several weeks. Then uh, the pupae uh, create this uh, kind of a, a nest, nest that you can see here. Uh, is a protection, and then the beautiful metallic um, colored adults emerge. Um, in late 2022, travel restrictions were lifted, and Hernan was preparing for that with uh, beetles that he's been collecting uh, in preparation to bring them over here. And early November 2022, he landed here with uh, a precious cargo of 60 adults and 450 eggs. And those eggs have already matured. Uh, it, it takes them about two weeks before they hatch. And they've already been matured and, and pretty much ready. And larvae started to hatch uh, within a day or two of Hernan's arrival. And we were on the go with uh, host range testing. I want to share with you now uh, the list of species that we host range tested this beetle on. It's quite a long list compared to a lot of other projects that we run. And I'll, when you see the, the, the list, the phylogenetic tree, you will understand uh, a little bit why. And here we go. So bear with me. What we're looking at here is a list of plant families. Chilean flame creeper, Tropiolum, is in the Tropiolaceae. Normally, when we run host range testing, um, we pretty much we don't have to go much further than the most closely related families. So theoretically, somewhere around here. Um, however, Tropiolum, Tropiolaceae, belong to the plant tribe Brassicalis. Brassicalis. And so all of those plant families that are listed here they have shared ancestry with the, uh, in, within the tribe Brassicalis. And within the tribe Brassicalis, as you may guess, there is the plant family Brassicaceae, which is a very important plant family with uh, quite a few indigenous species and quite a few important crops. And so we do know that Tropiolaceae and Brassicaceae share through that shared ancestry, they also share some um, secondary chemicals, uh, potentially secondary uh, metabolites uh, that could be related to plant defenses. And just because of that importance of the brassicaceae uh, and the New Zealand flora, both the indigenous and the uh, crop flora, we thought it was important to test all the way to the tribe level. And so therefore we also tested uh, anything in the plant families in that tribe, any plant family that was represented in New Zealand, either by indigenous species or by uh, economically important uh, species. So starting with, um, so we ended up with uh, about 29 entities. I'll explain why entities are not just species when we get to the Brassicaceae. Um, but we ended up with a list of 29 entities that we tested, and it is a long list compared to what we normally have to go through. So starting with the Tropiolaceae, uh, so we've got the Tropiolum, the genus Tropiolum, of course, the Chilean flame creeper. But we also have in New Zealand another five species of climbing Tropiolum species and another two species of nasturtiums. They're also Tropiolum. So all of those were tested. 
Then we go to the most closely related families, the Moringese and Caricase. So um, this is what's represented in New Zealand by um, a few growers of Moringa. Uh, if you're into superfoods, then you would have heard about Moringa. If you're not into superfoods, you probably haven't heard about Moringa. Uh, but Carica is the next one. Uh, that is where we find papaya. So both of those are pretty tropical, quite unlike the climate where we find Chilean flame creeper, the kind of Southland Otago. Uh, next, I'm not going to go through in detail uh, about those uh, families in between, uh, but what you see in blue font and underlined, those are, um, let's just highlight your, uh, to your eyes where we have represent representation in New Zealand. And then I want to move into the Brassicaceae, uh, and so we we've looked at um, five indigenous species of Brassicaceae, uh, another exotic, um, two exotic species uh, that are in the Brassicaceae but are non-Brassica, and then another four species of Brassica, of crops, Brassica, uh, and two of those species, we looked at each of them, uh, we looked at three varieties or cultivars. So um, things like uh, Brassica rapa, which has turnip, pak choy, uh, and Chinese cabbage, for example. So we, we had representation of those different varieties from that species. So that's why I'm talking about entities rather than species altogether. So 29 entities altogether. Let's go straight into the results. Okay, tropiolum. Start with tropiolum. All species of tropiolum support the beetle, support development, some better than others, and actually some of the other climbers uh, better than Chilean flame creeper itself. And let's talk a little bit about why, but let me show you first what it looks like. So here um, on the left, you can see a leaf of Chilean flame creeper, and you can see the notches, the feeding. And here on the right, another tropiolum climber uh, with a replicate that started at the same time and you can see quite a little bit more feeding. So those uh, other climbers are equally suitable hosts but the thing is that they're completely offset in their seasonality to Chilean flame creeper. So those other climbers they grow their foliage in winter when Chilean flame creeper dies back and has no foliage and they die back when Chilean flame creeper grows foliage and flowers. So completely offset in their seasons. And in fact, we had to grow them in uh, different growth chambers in different climates in order to be able to test them at the same time, because uh, if we would just go with their natural season, we would not have the plant material to compare them, to test them. Uh, and they would have been at the time that the beetle is not active. The beetle, um, I should have mentioned, seems to have one generation a year in the native range. So it, um, those adults come out in the spring uh, at the time that Chilean flame creeper starts to shoot and uh, they seem to be dormant in winter. Um, another thing, another interesting thing to mention about the tropiolum species is that um, there's on top of Chilean flame creeper, which is quite a, an established weed, there's another two species, one climber and one nasturtium, that's already naturalized and could potentially become quite weedy, if not already. Um, so yeah, perhaps the beetle could be a biocontrol agent for those. Another observation we made uh, during those tests was that when the larvae started feeding on Chilean flame creeper, the plant, the leaves oozed this gooey fluid that we didn't see in the winter climbers or in the nasturtiums. This is what it looks like. So those uh, little droplets that are circled, you can see the larvae here, and we've got those, those droplets of clear gooey fluid. And we didn't see that in the winter climbers. So could this be potentially some kind of a chemical defense that the plant produces? And maybe not having that defense in those winter climbers make them a more suitable host when encountering the beetle out of season. So perhaps it's that 
um, asynchrony, seasonal asynchrony that um, just makes them not need to produce that gooey fluid. Just a hypothesis, not tested. We can't really tell if that's the case or not. Let's move on to other species. So non brassica, so non tropiolum and non brassicaceae. Uh, we've seen two species where uh, there was trace nibbling, so less than 1% nibbling, and those species did not support development of the beetle. So when we say trace nibbling, you know, um, these tests, these non, uh, no choice tests, we basically put larvae that have just hatched from the eggs, have not had a chance to feed on anything, we put them on a leaf. They have the, the, the options to either try to eat what they've got underneath them or die from starvation. So, you know, can't blame some of them for trying to nibble whatever is underneath them. But yeah, at least those two did not support development. We did have one individual that completed development on Moringa. And just for perspective, uh, again, this is the replicate on Moringa. You can see the larva here. This is the larva that ended up developing to full. Here is a, a replicate on uh, Chilean flame creeper started at the same time. That larva develops quite a lot quicker. And if we look at other replicates on Moringa, most of those larvae, again, I remind you, we put them on the leaf directly, and most of them chose to abandon the leaf. Whereas again, you can see a replicate of Chilean flame creeper starting at the same time where the larvae are sitting on the leaf. So um, just for perspective. So one individual managed to complete development on Moringa. Moving on to the Brassicaceae, but starting with the non-Brassica species. So on the non-Brassica species, we had trace feeding on um, Lobularia, which is an exotic. And we had slightly more than trace, so a little bit more than 1% feeding on an indigenous species, Lepidium salandriae. But none of those, again, supported development to adulthood. And now moving on to Brassica. And bear with me while I take you through this. We had trace nibbling, again, less than 1% on Brassica oleracea, savoy, savoy cabbage and the species did not support development. And then we had minor feeding, so just a little bit over that 1% on uh, two varieties or cultivars of Brassica rapa. So one of them was the Pak Choi, um, one, the Pak Choi Honsai, and on turnip, and also on Brassica junkia mustard. And again, none of those supported development. Then we had Brassica chinensis, uh, Pak Choi dark dragon, where we did have one adult, one, one individual, one larva completing development. And we did have a few more replicates where there was nibbling. And then we had one larva also completing development on Chinese cabbage, on Brassica rapa. So with uh, Brassica rapa, um, we were not concerned about those results. We um, statistically, we can. Uh, be confident enough that this will not translate to uh, becoming a field host. With the dark dragon, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into those results. So what we did was uh, we added additional replicates on Brassica chinensis, quite a few more. And we also asked Hernan in Chile to do two things, a field survey or whether he can find um, Brassica crops that are not sprayed and are growing close to stands of Chilean flame creeper that has the beetle. And we also asked him to survey the grey literature in Spanish for any uh, instructions for growers of Brassica or any articles about growing Brassica, anything that mentions pests on Brassica and see whether there's any mentions of beetles, leaf beetles of any sort associated with Brassica crops. So the results are, we did 84 more replicates on uh, this dark dragon, and we found in five replicates, a little bit, tiny bit of nibbling, less than 1%, and then in one replicate, slightly more feeding, uh, about that, above that 1% threshold. All of the larvae ended up dying, 
most of them died at the first instar. One larva managed to make it through to the second instar and then died. So really nothing beyond that first instar, really. And then Hernan's field surveys discovered no evidence whatsoever of any beetles moving from Chilean flame creeper to brassica fields, brassica crops unsprayed. And also in the gray literature, he found no mentions whatsoever of any leaf beetle of any kind as a pest of brassica crops in Chile. And this is like going decades back. In conclusion, our conclusion is that Plaptail gueta is a safe agent to introduce to New Zealand. We do know that feeding tests uh, in our artificial testing environment tells us what is the fundamental or physiological host range of a candidate biocontrol agent. We also know that the field host range is a subset of that fundamental host range. So when you put a larva on a plant in a petri dish, it might eat something that in the field it will never even get a chance to encounter. So our challenge is to avoid rejecting safe agents based on those feeding events in the petri dish that are just a, a spurious effect of the testing environment. Um, we looked at the evidence from the extended testing, the field host range from Chile and the literature, and we determined that the host range of this beetle of Blattail goetite is limited to the genus Tropiolum. Whether the seasonal asynchrony will limit it to even more due to the, just to that species, to Tropiolum speciosum, we're unsure, but it could, it could be that it's pretty limited to this species. I will stop here and open it up for questions, and thank you for listening. Great presentation, really. Yeah, it seems quite prom promising, really. Um, so what we let the audience start writing their questions on the chat. I do have one or two questions for you. Um, you mentioned um, during the biology of the insects, they are not laying eggs directly on Tropelum speciosum, but in the litter. So um, how comes, what would be the reason why they don't lay on their host plant? Do you know uh, what could mm -hmm. be the reasons? Mm. Um, I'd have to say we don't know for certain because, again, mm. there's just bugger all known about the biology uh, other than what mm. Ernan found in the field. My educated guess would be uh, that Chilean flame creeper dies back in the winter, so there's no above ground material. And I would guess, again, that um, the eggs they do take a couple of weeks to develop um, before they hatch. So it's probably that if the adults emerge, um, it's probably too early in the season for there to be plant material for the larvae, for, for, for the egg to be laid on. So they lay somewhere that is close to where the plant will be. My guess can't be totally certain, but, mm. that, but that would be my, my thinking of that there's, there's just not. Chilean flame creeper plant material right there yeah. to lay on, but but it will be there and ready by the time the larvae hitch. Yes, yeah, so a common question from my crips. Since the eggs aren't laid on live plants, the larvae have to find their host. Mm. Just so the choice test with larvae might reveal a strong preferences or that they can find non targets. So what does that mean? That they have preferences or they just can't find their non-target? So in the tests, we we only did no choice tests. So we didn't mm. let them choose. So that, that is the more conservative test that really tells us um, what, what is fundamentally and physiologically can support development. Uh, really interesting to note that um, you know, when there's a little bit of condensation sometimes on the Petri dish, on the top of the Petri dish, and you can see the trails that the larvae do, mm -hmm. and you could really see in the non-target host 
that they walked around quite a lot on the top of the mm. petri dish and in the chilean flame creeper they yeah. they just straight on to it so it looked like even at a just um only hatched larva uh, even with without having fed on anything they seem to be able to walk <laughs> a bit of a distance uh, but it seems that they know what they're looking for <laughs> right yeah super interesting <laughs> yeah. a question from matthew hammond does the larvae eat the flowers do we know uh, we haven't tried giving larvae the flowers, but Hernan put adults on flowers and they do eat the flowers. Yeah. Okay. So we, if we, we didn't have flowers at the time of the testing, so we could potentially one day when, when they're out there in the field, we could uh, try um, when they do get released and approved. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm guessing they will. I'm guessing there's, there's going to be no, no issue for them to feed on the flowers. The, the leaves of the flower, the, the uh, petals are quite delicate. Mm -hmm. um, more delicate than, for example, the nasturtium leaves. And since they were able to eat the nasturtiums, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to feed on the flowers, on the yeah. petals. So that would have answered his second question. Does the beetle eat the plant or just the larvae? Or what would be the most damaging stage? Both the adults and the larvae yeah. um, feed. Yeah, I guess the larvae probably active a little bit longer. No, the, the beetles, the, the adults can be active for quite a long time as well. So throughout that they have, uh, they can be quite long lived. So they could feed on quite a, an amount. Yeah, they can be quite ferocious as well. Okay. A question from Mr. Williams. Does the beetle have obligate winter diapos? Do we know that? Yeah, so initially we thought it might be obligate because there was just the one generation uh, in in nature in in Chile. Uh, once we once we've had them in containment, uh, we've actually experimented. Robin has experimented with a few regimes, overwintering regimes, including non-overwintering. So there was uh, a group that she kept in uh, constant warmth, and they actually uh, continued reproducing more generations if not put uh, in overwintering conditions so it seems like it's not obligatory okay mm. um sophie sophie gibson pin seems to be quite <laughs> quite enthusiastic do you have any planned release sites already <laughs> Well, first we do have to go through the, you know, the consultation and the EPA approval, and before we can release. Um, at the, it, it is uh, Environment Southland that is leading the application process, so the first releases will be in Southland. The good news about this beetle is that it seems pretty easy to rear, and so I think we will be able to produce once we are allowed to take them out of containment, mm. I think we will be able to produce quite good numbers fairly quickly and we may be able to release them in quite a few sites early on. Cool, exciting. A question from Tara Murray. How big are the egg batches? Big enough that trace feeding from many hatchings, uh, hatchlings could have a negative impact on our small native lepidiums? And if, even if the larvae do not actually survive? They're not going to lay on Lepidium. The, the, the adults are just mm. not going to get there. So actually, um, what I didn't talk about here is that the tests that I've described here are the larval feeding tests. We have also put some adults in petri dishes with all of these hosts, and they didn't go for it. They didn't. They they were at all not attracted to those hosts um, when they were in mm. no choice situation. So they're just not going to get to lepidium. They're, they're yeah. just they're not going to be laid anywhere near lepidium. Um, we don't know what's the size of the batch. Um, I I don't have an answer for that. But yeah, it's just not going to happen on lepidium. Okay, that's good news. Another question from Matthew. Um, established Chilean flame creeper, 
has a major rhizome root system. Will the beetle actually kill the plants or just keep it kind of under control? Again, I don't have a clear answer to that. We just, just don't know enough about the biology of the beetle. My guess, since they don't feed on the rhizomes, they feed on the foliage, my guess is that they will weaken the plant. Possibly over time, when you get a repeated attack over years, you can expect to at least locally get some plant death, uh, premature death. It won't be um, an immediate impact um, in the first season of feeding, I don't think. Mm. So usually you would expect quite a few years before seeing a noticeable impact? Yes, mm. yes. That won't be instant. Yes, um, we sometimes with weed <laughs> biocontrol, it's it is rare. Sometimes yeah. we do get instant impact. Leaf feeders, I don't think that would be the case. And you can certainly see very fast impact with root feeders, uh, stem borers. With leaf feeders, I I would be pleasantly surprised. Well, you know, in St John's Wort, effects were pretty quick, and this is a leaf um, feeder, a chrysomelid as well. So. Maybe, maybe I'm underestimating. Um, I would give them a few years. I would give yeah, <laughs> and time will tell. We'll be sure yeah. to be uh, to be looking forward to spring 2025. Um, so that's the end of our questions session. Thank you again, Ronnie. Thank you for your time and giving us a very good overview of children for and creeper by control agents. Um, I hope that everyone enjoyed the rest of their afternoon and stay tuned for tomorrow's session on Darren's Barbary. Thank you very much and have a good time. Thank you. Bye.